It's about the people. My main priority is to make sure the team's happy. If I make sure that the 38, 40 people that we've got working there are happy, then I don't need to worry about the guests. If they're happy, the job will get they'll done. make the guests happy. It's simple. Today's episode was brought to you with the support of our friends at Kyoto Resto Bar. From the Rizakaya dishes to the most delicious sushi in Jersey, Kyoto Resto Bar is the place you should have in mind for your next on-island Japanese experience. Whether you choose to dine in or order online, I promise that you won't be disappointed. And now, back to the episode. Steve, welcome to Hospitality Insights. Thank you for having me. Just to give a bit of context, we used to work briefly in mm -hmm. the past, well, about six, seven years ago, uh, when I was working for Dolan's, which just on the record, I think is an amazing company, company or at least it used to be. I don't know now. You'll well, tell I'll me more. I'll tell you the truth in a yeah. while. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is it. So before we get to Dolan's, which uh, again, I feel they are amazing, but let's go back in time and tell me how you started in hospitality because... I remember like going now, I tried to put a few questions in my mind together and have an idea what I'm going to kind of ask you. And I remember seeing hospitality, hospitality. So it goes back in time for you. So what, what was the beginning? I had quite an unconventional start in the industry. So I was a little bit naughty as a, as a, as a youth uh, in my teens. So I had started to uh, get into the sort of drinking scene and pub scene from quite a young age. So by the time I was about 14, I had managed to find a pub in my nearby area that would serve me alcohol. So I had fake ID and I'd oh, wow. go to the pub and pretend I was 18 and have a few beers. And after a, a year or so of doing that, the owners clearly thought I was 18 because I'd been drinking there for a couple of years <laughs> and uh, playing pool and mixing with the locals and, and just being a bit of a you know an 18 year old who goes to the pub after school <laughs> but we're talking back in the uk right yeah, yeah this yeah, is yeah. in the uk yeah so this is in newport where i'm from uh, in south wales and by the time i was probably late 15 maybe early 16 i i'd sort of said look i've been drinking here for a couple of years have you got any work available <laughs> so by the time i was 16 i was working as a bartender in a local pub did that for a while, um, probably about nine months or something until the owners realized that I was still only 16 and I shouldn't be behind the bar. But by that point, we were pouring cask ales. I knew about seller, man seller, seller management. It was too uh, late. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I knew about selling skills, customer service, and I'd learned all of that, you know, how to change the barrels and everything else. So I'm still only 16, but they found out that I was 16, so they let me go. Uh, so I was dismissed from that job. So... I then, I had a friend who was working as a waiter at a four-star hotel about eight miles away from where I lived. So he said, I'll try and get you in there. So I went for an interview there and I got a job as a bartender in a four-star hotel and I was still only 16. So I, again, working illegally behind the bar, serving people that were all over 18 and just being a bit naughty. Um... I'd probably finished school then. I'd probably finished my GCSEs and I just loved working in the hotel. It was just fun. It was probably a little bit naughty because I was a bit too young to be there anyway. Um, and I just loved it. I loved earning money. I loved the job that I was doing and I was just soaking up knowledge like a sponge. So uh, if a waiter called in sick, I'd say, yeah, I can do that. And I'll jump in the restaurant, learn to be a waiter kitchen porter off same thing night port doesn't come in and I, I did that for for a while and to the point that you know I, I think at one stage I was a bar I did a bar shift the night porter didn't turn up so I did a night porter shift oh, wow. KP didn't turn up so I started washing dishes and I just kept going and before you know it this sort of general manager came in and said you still here I said yeah yeah he said you started with like 36 hours ago you know <laughs> something silly like that um and I, I'd just been there loving it. I was thinking about the money. I was soaking up all this information. I was improving my own skills. So I did that for a while. Um, got on very well there. Enjoyed working in the hotel. It was a nice size. Loads of weddings. Very busy. Learned a lot. And then uh, I got a call up to go into the military, which was my, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to go in the army from the age of about 12 years of age. That was all I wanted to do. So I, yeah, 16 and nine months I went in the army. So I had already worked as a pub bartender and now we're in a four-star hotel and I'd worked as a, a bartender, a waiter and everything else. Went in the army and after not very long got medically discharged from that. I had uh, dodgy ankles, dodgy knees and I was just very young. So uh, I had a meeting and they said, look, just get out the army and come back, you know, in a couple of years when you're fit and able. 
so I left the army, didn't know what to do, did a few sales jobs. I sold double glazing windows. I, I did a few terrible jobs. And then I fell back into the same hotel. So the same country house hotel that I'd worked at previously. I went back there as conference and banqueting supervisor, I think it was, which was all they had at the time. They, they sort of created a role for me. And I did that. So we were looking after nine weddings a weekend. It was very busy. And same thing, just try to soak up as much information as I could uh, from the, 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 you know, the heads of department, the other the hotel manager, and, and just loved the environment. I uh, met a lady, got engaged, took a job in Oxford, and, and that's it. Just started then working my way through the ranks. I had a, quite a career goal in mind. I wanted to be a hotel general manager by the time I was 30. I really liked my GM in that hotel. He was uh, very military in, in his style, and I liked that military style of discipline. Um, he was always very well-dressed. He was always very well-spoken. He, he was a really good guy. A um, bit marmitey, uh, so not everybody liked him. I liked him. <laughs> I thought he was pretty good. Um, and then, yeah, I, I took a job, assistant management couple, so of a, of a very small, I think it was 18-bedroom hotel in Oxfordshire. So... There was a GM couple and then an assistant management couple. That was myself and my fiance at the time. And we did everything. I, I was mowing the lawn. I was changing the beds. I was mm. cooking food. Just Like for any small business, yeah. I guess you would, right? Yeah, you would. And we we treated it very much like ours. And then we moved around a bit. I took a bar manager job in Sussex, a duty manager job up in Northumberland. Then I packed up and went traveling to New Zealand for a year, mostly traveling. But there was a six-month period there where I was cafes and restaurants manager of a ski resort uh, and a five-star hotel. So that was great. Same thing. I was traveling. I wanted money. I wanted knowledge. So I, I was working sort of 90 hours a week. And I Were was... you working when you were, tra when you were traveling? Or? I, I traveled for three months in the North Island of New Zealand. Then I settled down in a ski resort and I worked for six months straight. Um, started as a waiter and quickly got promoted to cafes and restaurants manager and then in my spare time I was a pizza chef at the same place <laughs> and I was crazy. working in the fine dining restaurant I represented the hotel in the waiter or restaurant of the year competition in in Auckland and then after that six months I left and traveled for three months in the South Island and then uh, that was me I was I was pretty much firmly in hospitality mm. then so uh, how did you get to Jersey? How, how how you ended up here? Well, I first came here in 2003, so pre-internet. I was working in a hotel in uh, in Newbury in the middle of England and leafing through the Caterer magazine. I think it's Caterer and Hotel Keeper or Hotel and Caterer, it's called now. Different times, not... Different times. You, yeah. you, you couldn't log on. You read <laughs> through the job pages in the back of the magazine and you wrote a letter or you phoned up. And I applied for a job as assistant manager at the Merton Hotel in Jersey, which was at the time a 302 bedroom, three star hotel, had an interview, came over for an interview. And that was fabulous for a, whatever I was, 20, 22 year old bloke, um, really steep learning curve for anybody local that knows the hotel, you know, sort of mm. four, four restaurants, six bars, a little nightclub in the basement and duty management Huge was- turnover. Huge turnover, you know, 600 guests coming in, going out on a Saturday, massive. Um, we we uh, we were doing all the cash ups. We were very hands on duty managers. You'd the the whole hotel isn't busy at the same time, so you just have to move people around. So you you know the the Belvedere's getting hammered, so just send everybody there, then regather the troops and send them to the star room for sort of post dinner drinks. But really good learning experience for me. And then after that. Uh, went off traveling about 2005, went to Australia for a year, came back. My fiance at the time was pregnant with my first child. So we needed a job somewhere near either her parents in Scotland or my parents in South Wales. So took a job at the Celtic Manor Resort in South Wales, which is a big five-star golf resort, huge, great operation. So I had a job there as food and beverage manager of the golf side of things. And did all sorts there. We opened halfway houses on the golf course. We <clears> did a sort of new opening of a new golf claw golf club house for the 2010 Ryder mm -hmm. Cup. So that was huge. And then I left there to go to Guernsey. 
moved to Guernsey. Oh, so you so, work in Guernsey for Yeah, I had two and a half years, I say it quietly, uh, <laughs> two and a half years in Guernsey as deputy GM of the Fermain Valley Hotel, and that was really good fun. Um, but I just, Guernsey became a little bit too small for me mm. um, on your... Guernsey's a lovely island, but it is small. And yeah. on your day off, you want to go and have a bevy or walk through the high street, do your shopping, and you'd have, ooh, just a few questions about my wedding next year. And it's, oh, <laughs> leave me alone. Because you kind of like know all the, you know all the island. Yeah, and it gets complicated to and, hide. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. It's, uh, it's, it's very difficult. So um, after that, I mean, that was nice. That was a stepping stone. So by that point, I had one child mm. and... I had met my fiance here in Jersey and, you know, we both love Jersey. So it was a kind of stepping stone yeah. back into the Channel yeah. Islands. Although it was a natural kind of progression coming in, it, in a way. It got us out of Newport, which is where I'm from. And it's it's not a great place for anybody that's been there. If you haven't been there, don't bother going. Um, <laughs> this isn't about Newport tourism. It's about Jersey. It um, so, yeah, we, it got us out of Newport. It got us into Guernsey, which which was lovely. And then from Guernsey, I, I think a, a recruitment agent called me or something and said, oh, there's a job in Jersey. Would you like to go for that? Um, so that was when I came over here, had an interview for general manager, my first GM job of the Hotel Christina. Uh, it, it, it was part, I'd always put stepping stones in my career. So whilst I had taken time out to go traveling and mm. to, I managed to find a balance between having fun not being completely career focused, but having stepping stones and making mm. the right career mm. choices. And you felt like Jersey was offering that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we we love Jersey, both my fiance and I uh, really liked the island, felt drawn to come back, liked the hotel, I loved the hotel, Christina. And it was my Amazing first GM view. job. Probably the best in Jersey. I think it's the best yeah, view from a hotel be, in Jersey. Yeah. Um, and I was 29 then, so I wanted... I said I wanted to be a general manager of a four-star hotel before I'm 30. I was 29, got the job. You made it. Very, very happy. Um, I'm still doing the same job now 30 years <laughs> later, but uh, uh, which which shows I enjoy it. And we'll probably get onto it later yeah. on. But, uh, you know, in, in terms... What do you think kept you in this in this role for... Well, I mean, not, I'm not saying necessarily with Dawn's, because I want to know that as well. Mm. Because till this point, till Jersey, your life was like a tumble dryer. Mm. It was like... A be here, a be there, explore, get, see the world, mm. which is nothing wrong. I mean, it, was, it got you where you are, right? Yeah, and I think it's a good thing for people to do for the first five, six. When you can take those eight, risks. Ten, when you can take the risks and you can take some gambles with your CV a little bit. You know, at some point you get to a stage where you've got to show stability and reliability and you've got to show consistent sort of career steps. But in the first part of your career, I think moving every 18 months, every two years, there's nothing wrong with that. Because as soon as a challenge was drying up for me, I was like, right, I've taken a duty management job in Northumberland. So I'm running lots of weddings. I've learned everything I can from this business and from this manager. The challenge has dried up. I'm off. I'm going to go and try somewhere else and learn as much as I can from that business. And I could have probably carried that on, but instead... I suppose my priorities change when, you know, children come along. Mm. I've got three kids now, but I, I had two kids when I took the GM job and then priorities change and it becomes perhaps less about your career goals and more about stability and, you know, having a, if you've got a nice school for the kids and a nice place to live, then priorities change. And that's probably why I'm still where I am now. Yeah. Um, yeah. But why with dollars? Because you see like, there are many people at your age, for example, in hospitality, mm -hmm. and they, although they have commitments, whatever, children, you know, family and so on, they move from one place to another. Did you feel like Dolan's was the, was the right place for you for that long? Yeah, yeah. And if, if I didn't feel that way, I, I would have moved on. Um, I suppose I'm probably a little trapped, which isn't a bad thing. Because I'm trapped in Jersey, and there's much worse places to be trapped. <laughs> um, I, I love Jersey. I think it's a fab place to live. You know, I know people are, are moaning about the, the cost of living and all the rest of it. Nice places cost a lot of money to live in. You know, if you wanted to Fair. move to the south coast of England, you'll also pay a lot of money. And what people here don't realize, perhaps, is that it's also very expensive in the UK. And, you know, I've been to the UK quite a few times this year, and it's expensive there as well. Um, but I love Jersey. I think it's it's safe. It's it's. I love the beaches. I love the way of life. It's the right size for me. Like I said, Guernsey was too small. Jersey works for me. 
so I'm not planning to leave. And I've got kids now in from 17 years down to three years of age. So they're all in school. They're all happy. Um, so I'm not planning to leave Jersey, but it does limit my options somewhat mm. in that what are the GM jobs would I like to have in Jersey? And there aren't any really. Oh, they're not better. Not better. <laughs> and there's a, an element of risk to yes. changing jobs. I could perhaps apply for a GM job at the Grand and and then go there and go, do you know what? It's it's either too stressful or I don't like being part of a larger company. Mm. My face doesn't fit. Well, it's hell of a gamble when you've got three kids and you've got a mortgage yeah. and you, you know, you you've got these things. So if your face fits somewhere and you've reached your your perhaps your, your mm. career goals like I had, then some it becomes more about comfort and like yeah. I say it's But you still made a change uh Within the company, right? Because you were like Christina. Yeah. There was a seasonal hotel and moving to a almost a year. Well, you were working year around anyway. Yes. But then what made you switch? You know, was it like uh, the opportunity was like, you know what? I can, I, I'm sure I can handle, you know, because Somerville is like the flagship, right? For the, for the company. It is. It's, yeah. And, and those are the pros and cons I was weighing up. So when I was asked to kind of go for GM at, at the Somerville, I already had nine years of a proven track record at the Christina providing good results, reduced staff turnover, increased profits. So, so I had a good track record behind me. And then when I was asked to sort of go for the job at the Somerville, I thought, hmm, I'm going to have to think carefully about this because Whilst as a GM at the Hotel Christina, I do work all year round. You certainly take your foot off the gas for a good few months of the year. True. Um, and there is less stress. There's less, you know, you haven't got to manage a team of people for five months of the year. So for a bit more money, do I want stress all year round? Well, I weighed it up and and in the end thought, why not? Let's, let's give it a go anyway. Um, and... Yeah, so so that's kind of where we went with that one. So mm -hmm. nine years at the Hotel Christina and, and now um, coming up to, what, four years? Four years, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was. What are the differences for people that probably, I mean, not everybody that's watching this podcast, most of them are hospitality and they'll have an idea right away. I kind of get a sense, you know, what was the difference between a seasonal hotel and a, and, and a year around in terms of like, from your point of view as a as a GM, you know, mm -hmm. how how... What were the challenges in one and what are in the others? And, you know, what, what, what is better depending on the situation? Yeah, I, 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 I am a list maker. So whenever I make a big decision, I'll weigh up the pros and the cons and I'll write oh, it nice. down and I'll say, right, OK, what are the pros and cons of me staying at the Christina? What are the what do I like and don't like about it? The, the seasonal business is really hard and it's it's I think it's it's underappreciated. I don't think people appreciate how hard the seasonal businesses are um constantly hiring i guess yeah and you've the three hotels in our group are all four star hotels okay somerville's four gold star but they're all four star hotels so the expectation from the guests is the same across all three so guests are expecting they're paying a good average room rate they're they're, they're, they're paying a good rate they expect four star mm. service from the day you open what was the difference sorry to interrupting you know because you said gold star is it is it like jersey tourism giving the yeah give standard yeah of, it was of like um, higher yeah jersey higher. quality assured so it's yes yeah, a slightly higher rating if you like it's like uh, if you were with the aa and you got four star yeah, yeah, yeah. four red star so you've got normal four star and you've yeah. got the gold i didn't know that yeah. i knew there is there are two the aa and you have the jersey tourism kind of like yes. a, a, a yeah. stars yeah. i don't know that yeah sorry for interrupting no but. that's all right um so in the christina you've you've got to do all of your recruitment or in any seasonal business do all of your recruitment and then start your team off and you only got them for a, a week maybe two weeks before you open and by that time you've got to make sure that they're all working to the four star standard straight away it's a very strange industry in that 99% of the team members live in. So find me another industry where 99% of the employees all live together in the same building or in the same rooms mm. and they're sharing rooms. So we were taking 30, 33 people from 14 different countries employed purely on telephone interviews oh. or WhatsApp interviews. So you were managing guests and staff, you know, yeah. even on their time off. Well, in sort of February, <laughs> March, and you're trying to recruit people, you know, you, you you advertise, you get all of these CVs come in, then you're doing a phone interview, and now you've got to take, all right, I've got 35 people. Now I need to make sure they're the right people, make sure it's the right team, 
make sure they're happy living together, sharing rooms. You know, they, they don't have any friends on the island. They don't know anybody. They don't have any hobbies, no clubs, no associations they're members of. So you bring 30 odd people together from 14 different countries and you say, that's your room. You're sharing with that guy. And you start work tomorrow morning in a strange place, a country they've never been to, and you've got to train them all up and you've got to have them to a four star standard within a week. So it's super challenging, really challenging and really, really difficult for that first sort of month, that transition as you try and find out who likes who, who gets on. Have I recruited the right bartender or would that bartender be better in the restaurant and swap some people around, try and identify people's strengths and weaknesses super quick. And the thing that I suppose that the, that the key thing was finding out who was pulling against you because you're never going to recruit the right 33 hmm, people. There's true. always going to be a couple of people there that just, they're not right. And you got to live with it, right? Because you can't get it right 100%. No, you'll never get it right. Re recruitment's always a gamble. It, it's, it's really, you'll never get it right. So it's always a gamble. You're phoning up people. You're having an interview. They sound great. They sound perfect. They come over to Jersey and they don't like Jersey. There's, there's the first thing. I don't like Jersey. It's too small. I didn't expect it to be like that. Um, in Guernsey, it was kind of, oh, there's no McDonald's. There's no KFC. <laughs> My God, I'm off. You oh, know? wow. And I really had people. I, I interviewed a couple in Guernsey once and they turned up in the evening. I didn't see them. Next morning, I went in to sort of greet them and they'd already gone. And I said, Where, where's that couple gone that arrived last night? Oh, they found out there was no McDonald's, no KFC, and and they've they've done one. They've gone. They've, That's crazy. They've gone off to the airport. And I was like, what? <laughs> they didn't even Google guns. You know, they didn't do any research Surely that was important for them. You know, they well, should have. Exactly, but some people don't do that. Um, so, you know, how, there's always a gap. There's a big percentage chance they're not going to like Jersey. They might not like the hotel. They might not like me. They might not like their colleagues, their, their living accommodation. There's a million things, factors that come into it that they won't like. And sometimes you just employ a plum and you just employ somebody that doesn't work and they're, they, they cause trouble or they're pulling against you. So you've got to make sure that your values are aligned. Everybody buys into your ethos um, and, and they all know what your goals are and what the business is trying to achieve. And the key is identifying very, very quickly somebody that's working against you. Because if you leave them in there, they're just going to turn others against you. It's like a bad you... apple. Absolutely, <laughs> it is. And, bef you know, you may have had one bad apple. Now you've got eight bad apples. And if they're all in the same department, then you're really screwed. So the, the, the key is to identify the people that aren't right for you and to say see you later and to move on with your season. Because by the time you've got to, you know, if you're open from April to October, by the time you've got to July, A, that pot of potential recruits is much much smaller because everybody's employed the good ones are employed um but b it's 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 just so late in the season so you're like oh do you know yeah, what you've let's, got let's to move just, quite fast yeah, comparing to if, others if you get to july so let's just plod on we'll carry them until october and we won't have them back next year so that's the seasonal thing and really really difficult the all year round thing the benefits of it are I was telling myself when I took the job was, well, you've got an established team. You've got eight. In theory. In theory. <laughs> you've got eight people in your restaurant. One person leaves. You bring one in. They all train. You know, everybody trains that person. It shouldn't be that tricky. And that's kind of one of the benefits that I talked myself in saying, well, you know, okay, it's a full-time team. Everybody's been there for a long time. They all know what they're doing. They train themselves. They train each other. It should be a lot more stable. And it was, but I mean, I, I took over to Somerville, November 2019, and we were shut down with COVID by, yeah, so that was November 2019. I started by the end of January 2020, we were closed due to COVID, and that threw a whole new spanner in the works. But, um, and, you know, we've, we're, we're open now and normal, and we've had a great year this year. It's been pretty stable, and it's been very enjoyable. How did you find, how do you see the difference between prior to COVID and now? Do you see that there's something changed or we are now back to, let's say, 2018 or whatever it was before? Yeah, I'd say we're, we're pretty much, we're not financially, financially, we're ahead of where we were 2018, 2019, but the business is, is settled now. It's, we, we're fully open. Everything's operating as it was in 2018, 2019 and pre-COVID. So we had a couple of strange years through COVID as everybody did. We were all adapting. It was new for everybody. And we, we sort of got through that. Last year was, I think I, I touched on it earlier with you. Mm -hmm. So, so last year should have been the first normal year of operating and it wasn't because we we had come out of covid we were closed in january for refurbishment 
just after January, we had quite a large exodus of some of our full-time team members, uh, a chef, a restaurant manager, people that I think, because we didn't turn over any team members. So through COVID, one of the benefits to us through COVID was that we didn't lose any team members. Because we were such a good employer, because we were paying everybody fully, we were looking after people, we were taking care of people's mental health, and, and we were really a compassionate employer, mm. we didn't lose anybody. But that doesn't mean people aren't dreaming of moving or planning on moving. So when the world kind of opened up at the end of January last year for us, it was kind of, you know, this couple are going off to Switzerland, they're going to travel Australia, this one's going to open their own business, and this one's going to take another opportunity. So we lost quite a few long-standing permanent employees just as we reopened last year and, and you found yourself almost in like a seasonal situation yeah hotel. well we did we we had a lot of people to recruit we didn't have any we did we tried to recruit from the uk and from europe and it was very very difficult we had just come out of the eu so we had this whole new work permit work visa application type thing that had ground to a halt because of everything that was happening in ukraine at the start of last year so visa processing that was supposed to be two or three weeks ended up being three or four months so we ended up being sort of seven or eight team members short for the first six months of last year and we could never get ahead of the game then we were always on our back foot we perhaps then when time isn't on your side you can't afford to perhaps you haven't got many applicants to choose from so you end up perhaps making rush decisions you don't trust your gut instinct you need to get bodies in place to fill gaps so you perhaps recruit the wrong people and then you perhaps allow those bad apples to stay a bit longer because it's either oh it's, it's a body it's in place yeah. they're filling a line on the roster let's mm. keep them there but actually it's the wrong decision and you know you i've, I've learned that sort of panicked or rushed recruitment is is never the right thing so if time's on your side you should always trust your gut instinct uh, so last year was a very difficult year. Um, this year, I would say, is our first normal year since COVID. Are there any challenges this year? I mean, what are some of the challenges? Or are you kind of like, you know what? This is probably the best we've had, you know, and, and, and in terms of probably years yeah. back, not, not necessarily for Somerville. It's probably the best year I've had as a manager. I feel really, really happy with the team. We've had very low team turnover. We've had great training. We've invested more in the team in terms of activities for the team to keep them engaged. Um, it's been a really good year. We could have done with some more food and beverage sales, uh, you know, so I think through COVID, we lost the accommodation sales for a large part of it because we couldn't open the bedrooms. And there was a hell of a lot of local support from the food and beverage side of things. So people couldn't go on holiday, they couldn't travel, they couldn't leave the island. So they spent their hard earned money on food and drink and by mm -hmm. having staycations. And we saw our food and beverage sales absolutely spike in 2021, 2022. Mm -hmm. I don't think we'll ever see numbers like yeah. we did. It was, you know, it, yeah. it, it was, Packed. It was brilliant. Yeah, but this year it's not because you're doing something wrong. It's more that the situation was more favorable. Yeah, absolutely. And like I say, we're back to sort of, you know, food and beverage sales that would be classed as normal. So sort of pre-COVID. Um, so, yeah, it's it, it it's been interesting to see the changes. And the accommodation sales have come back now. So we've had great occupancy in the rooms. We've had great average room rates. There's, there's no shortage of tourists wanting to come over and spend good money on lovely rooms in a great hotel. Um, it's just, like I say, if, if we could combine that with the spike in food and beverage sales that we had during <laughs> COVID, we, we'd be laughing. It'd be great. What makes a great hotel, in your opinion? Because you work in so many places. Like mm. for you, you know, for your standard as a general manager, you know, how do you want your place? If let's mm. say you take something from scratch, where do you want that place to be in a way? Yeah, it's a tricky one because it's, I, I want different things as, as a tourist. If I go traveling, I look a lot for facilities. I want to make sure there's a spa. I want to make sure there's a gym and there's a view. And so so I tend to holiday in different sort of places, but mm. uh, to, to what I work in. From a work point of view, I think the reason I've stayed with Dolan Hotels is the size is perfect. Um, you know, 60, 59 bedrooms at the Somerville. I think the hotel that I started working when I was when I was 16, that was about a 50 bedroom country house hotel. I like that style. I like that size. Um, it was big enough to present a challenge, but it was small enough that you could get to know all of your guests on a personal level. 
Uh, if you if you've got holiday making guests in for a few days or a week, you can really get to know them. In the Celtic Manor Resort, when you've got a thousand guests, that's it, it's just too big. You're a small part, you know, in, in a big organisation. So. From a work point of view, I like the size of property that I'm working in, which is probably why I've stayed with Dolan Hotels for so long. We're quite light on facilities at the Somerville, but we know that. We know we don't have a spa. We've got an outdoor pool. But what we do, we do very well. You compensate with other things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Service and, you know, a home from home environment, approachable luxury. We, you know, we want people to feel relaxed and at home, which which they do or, you know, most of them do. So what makes a great hotel? You know, everything from cleanliness, views, location, facilities, above all, I would say service. And I think that's one thing that we've always been very good at in the group. And it probably comes from the owners and filters down mm. into the, the senior management, the general managers, and then into the team is the personal service that we offer. And the guests will remember the relationships and the interactions that they've had long after they've forgotten the decor of the bedroom or the quality of the food even they'll remember that relationship they built with that awesome waitress that mm. they saw every morning during their seven day stay or, or whatever it is so it's about the people i th i think it's about yeah. the people more than anything else and you know not the, the hotels are lovely and we've re reinvested well across the group and you know there's the somerville's been completely refurbished in the last three years which is great so it's been a great level of reinvestment that we're putting into the other two hotels as well um but i think it all comes down to the people really how do you keep these people motivated because i think that's one of the biggest challenge you know you have i know alex you have bill you have and you know, they're all <clears throat> passionate about this industry and about the island and offering a good service mm -hmm. and i know they're really kind people but you know how do you pass that on to from even from you down you know to, to your staff mm -hmm. and probably you know before it was probably even more challenging when you have and the other two are seasonal right they are they're still going seasonal right? yeah, yeah so that must be even more challenging but mm -hmm. how do you do it in your situation now where you are i think just having a clear ethos and and a clear goals and just getting that into the team members even from a recruitment stage so when i'm recruiting now i'll i'll probably spend half an hour asking questions and i'll probably spend an hour talking about what it is that we do it it's you know if you get somebody's cv come through and they've got eight years of experience as a bar supervisor well you know they've got the skills you know that they can hmm. make cocktails and they can manage a bar that's that's a given otherwise he wouldn't have eight yeah. years of experience what the important thing is, is that we're the right place for them. So I'll spend a lot of time telling them exactly how, how we operate. Set the expectations, we do. I guess. Absolutely. Because, right? you know, the, the last thing we want takes a lot of time, takes a lot of cost to recruit. The last thing we want is to employ somebody. Yeah, they answered all the questions, right? Let's bring them in. They get in and then they say, well, this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't, you know. So mm -hmm. I try and be completely honest and I try and make sure that whoever I'm interviewing knows exactly what our vision is exactly what our goals are exactly how i manage people um and and then try and keep things fun as well try and keep things light-hearted try and lead from the front especially for the first certainly with the seasonal properties yes be very very hands-on lead from the front show everybody that you're prepared to do everything you're asking them to do right from the start i'll make beds i'll wash dishes i'll wash pans and all the rest of it so that let everybody see that you're doing that and that you don't shy away from it and that you're capable of doing it and that you're willing to do it. And then they'll follow, hopefully. Yeah. Not so in much. In ideal situations, in an this ideal is how situation, it works. they'll see you doing it and they'll follow. And, you know, that's leadership. And if you're happy, you know, my main priority is to make sure the team's happy. I don't need to worry. If, if I make sure that the 38, 40 people that we've got working there are happy, then I don't need to worry about the guests. If they're happy, the get they'll make the guests happy. It's simple. It's amazing how infectious it is, how you can see how people's moods transfer into others. If, I, if I'm having a bad day and I'm in a mood and I take that out on the team and I'm grouchy, aggressive, short, tempered, whatever, if I'm like that with the heads of departments, very quickly their team will be like that and very quickly the guests will be like that it's almost a you can feel it in the air you know you can feel the tension so if i'm happy or at least acting like i'm happy <laughs> that will flow into everybody else so you know try and stay calm try and be cool calm and collected try and look like you're happy all the time remember that you're on stage 
and it's an act sometimes. You know, sometimes I, I don't want to speak to people. I don't want to speak to guests. I don't want to speak to team yeah. members at all. I'd rather be in the office doing some paperwork We're or humans, whatever. humans, right? Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes I just don't want to see people. But don't let the team see that. So put on your act, let the team see it, and hopefully it'll just flow into them. And it, it's so, it, it fascinates me, the psychology of people. And, and that's something I, you know, I love about customer service, about recruitment, about building a team, is, is seeing how quickly your mood can affect others. So it's important to keep that in mind. How do you see recruitment changing or how it changed, you know? So I'm sure, let's say 10, 15 years ago, it was slightly different, even the area you were kind of targeting. How do you see it now comparing to what it was? Yeah, it has changed. Um, you know, go back 10, 15 years and you'd have a constant stream of CVs and you'd have people knocking on your door wanting to come and work there. And that has gone. Now we've got to go out and target certain areas. In terms of the advertising, that's that's the same. We'll put an advert on gov.je or we'll, worst case scenario, we'll use recruitment agents, but we try not to do that because they're expensive. Um, we'll, we'll use Indeed and, and other sort of internet-based um, recruitment avenues. The interview inside is still the same. I'll probably spend a bit more time managing their expectations and talking about what we, but that's just come from experience of recruiting the wrong people or, or recruiting yeah. in the wrong way, getting people in that, you know, it, ju it just didn't work. It wasn't right for them. Um, we've had to change where, where we're looking as well. So I think it's, it's quite open that we don't have too many Jersey applicants when we advertise for a job. We we genuinely don't. The perception of hospitality in the UK is still and in seen Jersey, as a low bar. Right? It's, absolutely. It's it's a job you do if you fail your GCSEs, if That's you crazy. don't stay in the school. It's 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 looked down upon. I'd say especially in Jersey, which is which is a shame. And it really is. The, the, here it's kind of if, if you do well in your GCSEs, you go and do A-levels. The expectation is you go off to university and when you're ready to have kids, you move back to Jersey. <laughs> if you screw up your GCSEs and you've really got nothing to do, well, what are you going to do? It's 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 not seen, and, and the same in the UK, it's not really seen as as a career um, by, by that many people. And you do get looked down upon in the industry sometimes and um, it's, it, it's it's a real shame because it, it there are it so many opportunities shame, yeah. it's such a fun industry i mean I, I i love it there's so much flexibility challenge variety and certainly if you start looking at big hotels like the celtic manor resort that had 600 employees and you know you, you've got everything you, your maintenance department has got probably 10 different trades. Your, your green keepers, so you've got horticulturalists, you've got green keepers, window cleaners, security personnel. There's so many, you know, you want to be in marketing? Great. we got sales and marketing department in this big hotel. You can work in that. Human resources, everything. Yeah. So there, there's there's so much variety. And then even in a smaller property like, like where I am, you might not have the variety of, of lots of different departments and lots mm. of different job titles but in, in you know my job is is filled with variety whenever you're dealing with people every day is different you know whether that's team members or guests you never know what your day's challenges are going to be you can have a fair idea but there's always going to be a curveball yeah so it's exciting for yeah i think people that perhaps don't appreciate what we do or, or perhaps look down their noses at people that work in hotels or start off as a kitchen porter or waiter or something like that. They're, they're just not aware of how much fun the industry is, how much career progression and quick career progression yeah. that, that the industry has. Even probably quicker now than it used to be, right? Yeah. It, it all comes down to attitude. I think if you've got, the, you know, if you've got the right person that's Perhaps like I was when I was 17, 18, I was soaking up knowledge like a sponge. I was keen to move around across departments. I was keen to move across businesses. If you've got the right attitude and you're you're eager to work and you're keen and you're enthusiastic, then you can go as far as you want in this industry, you know, as far as you want and, and quickly. Hmm. You have such a large set of skills and, you know, I work for you just briefly hmm. and I could recognize because I feel like I can see in people, you know, sometimes where... You know, they're dedicated, you know, they, they know what they're doing and everything else. So you would be perfect for any company in Jersey that would need someone to manage people. I'm talking from other industries. Yeah. Have you ever considered, you know, leaving hospitality for something else? Last year, so I had a shocker of a year. 
just mentioned that earlier, that recruitment was an issue. It was one step forward, two steps back. I hated my job. <laughs> my bosses <laughs> will probably catch this. I hated he my job. He probably knows it. He probably does. Yeah, I think I've probably told him. <laughs> I, I hated my job last year. I, I was amazed that I was actually managed to survive the year and not have a heart attack in work. I was that stressed. I was anxious. I didn't want to go to work on many, many days. I was scared. I was stressed. I was, you know, having palpitations. I was on the verge of, well, you know, I was having panic attacks. I, I was really having a horrendous year and I was ready to walk away from the industry. I, I, I was looking at jobs as a tree surgeon. I was looking for that complete change of, do you know what, to hell with this. I, I can't deal with this anymore. I want to go and climb trees and chop branches down and or go and be a fisherman and, and get out on the boats and just do a complete lifestyle change. And then, I mean, I had a couple of months off through the winter and came back refreshed, rejuvenated. When things are going well, I love the industry. I, I love <laughs> what I'm doing. And in fact, even when things aren't going well, I love the industry. I love what I do. Last year was 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 crap. It was um, just one off. Kind of it thing. was a one off. You know, in, in 13 years of being a general manager, last year was, was just horrible. Um, it was just a perfect storm. I'm happy that my deputy manager stayed with me throughout that and we both got through it. And, and you know, it, 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 it makes you stronger. What if you can go through something like that and beat off that adversity and get through it, then that just makes you stronger and you learn from that. So then this year, when the odd challenge crops up, you go, do you know what? We got through a hell of a lot worse than yeah. this last year, a hell yeah. of a lot worse. So it makes all of those, little challenges so much smaller when you've gone through a really challenging year and you've you've come out the other side of it so it does it does make you feel stronger um no i i very rarely look for jobs i never look for jobs <laughs> i i don't um i don't go on to gov.j and look for jobs i've considered changing industry um and then very quickly changed my mind i mean i've got so much freedom i've got so much flexibility and I just love it. Like yeah. I say, you, you know, just I, had the perfect feed for, yeah. for this job and, I, and it I, works. Yeah, it works for me. Um, you know, I'm probably a lot more office based. You know, it's not what I thought I would be doing when I started work in hospitality. I loved the people interaction, the customer service. Now I would say I, I, I don't have much guest interaction, really. Mm. I, I have some. I speak Paper to a lot. But I, I speak to guests when I want to. Um <laughs> I've I've got the I've got the luxury of when I'm not in the mood for guests, I can go back to the office and uh, I can leave that to somebody else. But I speak to the team members all day, every day. You know, I'm constantly laughing and joking and chatting and talking to them or they're coming to see me. And so I've got a huge amount of people interaction all day, every day, mostly from the team. I'd say probably 70 or 80 percent team interaction, 20 percent guest interaction. But that could be a lot more if I wanted it to be. But yeah, I mean, if you're happy where you are, why why change, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. But then, okay, staying in the same industry, have you ever considered opening your own place? Because that's, again, staying with the industry, but then just more work, probably. <laughs> it is. I, I, I spoke about this. I was interviewing somebody this afternoon, and uh, I asked him that question. And, and his answer was kind of the same as mine, is that I'm probably not that much of a risk taker. Mm. Um financially i don't have a lot of money and what i do have i don't really like to gamble it um so i can gamble with my boss's money instead <laughs> i suppose it, it it hasn't really crossed my mind i think food and beverage industry is very difficult at the moment it, it's it's a tough tough industry to be in it's not something that i would with three kids and yeah. a mortgage it's not something that i'm willing to take a gamble with if ever i had a backer or something like that maybe my opinion would change. I quite like the security of being employed mm. and especially the security of being employed by a good employer. Um, yeah. And I found a company here where <laughs> I'm speaking on behalf of them, but I like them. I think they like me. The face fits. We trust each other. They give me a pretty free reign to work within the parameters that they've set. Mm -hmm. So I know what they're trying to achieve and we all get along and perhaps that's unusual and perhaps people move around a lot because they don't find that. Mm. Uh, I certainly didn't think, you know, my career goals were up to when I was 29. I didn't give any thought to what would happen after I became GM. 
I don't think, you know, would I want to go to central London and try and work my way up the ranks in a big five star, 400 bedroom property? It doesn't really appeal. I like the size of the 60 bedroom hotel. It's manageable to the point that you know your people. You almost like know your guests as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I like the size, the face fits, and we all seem to get along. Um, They look after their employees and hopefully I look after them in return and, and we're all happy. So in terms of sort of the future, I, I didn't think I'd ever be in a job for 13 years. I used to be in a job for about two or three years and then move <laughs> on. 13 now, but I'm still learning. And okay, I'm not learning from not the anybody basics, as probably. such, but every day is different and every day throws up new challenges. The world has changed. People have changed. I think that I mentioned before the word psychology, and that's fascinating for me, the psychology of people and perhaps how to lead, how to motivate, how to manage people. And that is something that's changed a lot in recent years, I think. We've had to really change our management style. So back 10, 15 years ago, you could be a little bit like Gordon Ramsay and you could shout and ball and be what would be termed now yeah. as, as unprofessional. But perhaps mm-hmm. that was that what, was the standard. That, that, that was time. hospitality, and that was kind of the norm. And you, you'd shout and you'd bollock somebody, and <laughs> and you'd get away with it. I'm not saying it's the right or wrong way, but perhaps that was that was how I learned. And I I said about a sort of military background, and you could give somebody a bee sting, and then you could you know move on from that. It came a turning point where. You, you you can't talk to people like that anymore. You've you've got to be nice. They'll walk out be, and then they'll walk good out. Luck, and good luck you, ex- exactly, they <laughs> would. So you had to become more nurturing and you know more sensitive and more encouraging and and sit down and spend more time and and show more empathy and more understanding. Care, I guess. Of, yeah, know. absolutely, and really take care. And I think it's probably just come with age as well. And being a parent of of three kids, well, I'm also a parent to all of my employees there. We spoke before, they're, they're away from home, they're in a foreign environment, they're homesick, their mental health might be taking a bit of, bit of a, a hit. So you've got, to, you've got to sort of see that and see those reactions. And like I say, that's, that's probably come with age as well. So I'm a lot more sympathetic. I'm a lot more, you know, I'll, I'll show a lot more empathy. I'll, I'll just be a lot more caring of the team members and try and get the best at them. And as I said before, if, if the team are happy, the guests are happy. So... We try and make sure we're looking after the team members, not just in remuneration, but their accommodation, their mental health, their work-life balance and, and things. So, you know, we've changed. It, it used to be that you put everybody on six-day weeks and, you know, everybody's yeah. going to graft and it's that's true. it. No other options. And over the years, we've moved from six-day weeks to five-day weeks. We've tried to get rid of split shifts. We've tried to increase wages as much as we can. We've tried to improve living accommodation and, and just really try and... Mm try and look after people a bit more. Is accommodation becoming, because I was asking uh, previously when I had the podcast with Simon Saw, so mm. I feel like you're almost getting to a point that almost all, almost on, only the, the hotels or hospitality businesses that have accommodation will survive in a way. I'm not sure whether it's there where it's heading, but I can feel that way because it's getting challenging, you know, from all points of view getting stuff. It is challenging. And, you know, we've, we've moved now, we're recruiting a lot from, from South Africa and, and from Kenya, and we're using the work permit and work visa system. So mostly nine month permits, nine months. Well, nobody's going to rent a place for nine months. You won't even find a place on a nine month mm-hmm. term. It's 12 months or nothing. The cost is prohibitive. If, if you tell people what the rental costs are, very difficult. We used to have a lot more local locally qualified live out people. When I started at the Somerville in 2019, we had quite a few people that were living out, paying their rent, and they'd been with us for a while. We lost most of those in 2020. So we had to then adopt almost a a seasonal business model. So we now run the business on a Whilst we're open for 11 months, we'll run it on nine month work permits mostly. So they overlap. So they overlap, exactly. And we'll have a couple of people from the the Christine or the Sands might start with us for a couple of months and then go to the Christine or Sands for six months, or they might stay on a couple of months after those two hotels close. So we're, we're adapting and finding a way to work with that. But if we didn't have 
living accommodation, we, we'd be in real trouble. And, and we don't, we do run out. So we end up then in the middle of summer contacting estate agents and trying to rent places, which just takes us away from the business that we should be doing. Uh, so, so accommodation is always an issue. It's always a challenge. Um, we're fortunate in that we've got a fair bit of it, mm. but we always need more. Is there a plan of expanding? Because I know when I was working with 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 Dolans, and I'm talking seven years ago, probably COVID changed all that. All that you know. Is there a plan of, plan of of buying maybe a new property, opening a new place, or after COVID, kind of like everything you know, be like you know what? Let's manage what we've got and stay where we are. It's probably a question for for my bosses and the mm. owners. I, I th- we have had a restaurant in the past, which yeah. which we don't have anymore. So we've got the three hotels. I think we're always open um, to see what's out there, and you know, we we I know in the past we have looked at other places. I think that I think we're quite happy where we are with the three hotels. Um, yeah. My bosses might say different, but <laughs> there's no public. They haven't told me that they're yeah. looking to expand certainly not into other hotels. So there'll be some changes over the next few years as the owners of the business, I expect, will will retire at some point and and other people will come into it and and run it. So the vision may change slightly, but at the moment, I feel Mm. that it's fairly settled. Mm. We've got the three, four-star hotels, all with great occupancy. Um, We're reinvesting into all three properties. So as far as I'm aware, I think we're quite happy. Do you think there is a risk? I mean, I know it's, again, it's not a question that somebody else should answer it, but again, feel feel free to push back. <laughs> but do you feel there is a risk like these, any of these properties will ever become flats? I don't think so. This, <laughs> I remember when I was at the Christina, you know what Jersey rumors are like. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's why I'm asking. There yeah. was something around here. <clears throat> there was, there was. And, and uh yeah, you know, I remember hearing a story about sort of you know Dandaro going around the Grand, and they've got their surveying equipment, <laughs> and you know they're just sneaking around the corridors. Um, we had this. I went on holiday years and years ago. I went to France, say in the car, came back. Customs pulled me over, getting off the ferry. Where you know where you going? What you do? And I said, oh, I'm the manager of the Christina. And the customs guy said, Oh, they just sold that, haven't they? <laughs> I said, shit, you're kidding me. I said, I've only been away for a week. What the hell's <laughs> happening here? You know, I come off from my holiday and the first thing Lost I hear your is, job right yeah, now. Yeah, hotel's shutting down. So I sent an email straight away. I said, I've just heard this. Is it true? No, 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 absolutely not. It, But, you know, I, I think what had happened, some surveyors. So if anybody knows Hotel Christina, you've got a nasty turning off, uh, off Montfellard. It's almost mm. a U-turn. And I think somebody had seen some surveyors there with their equipment, just having a look. Because <laughs> obviously, if somebody was going to put an offer in and say, look, we want to buy your hotel, we want to flatten it, we want to build a load of apartments, but we need to do something with that access. If, if they couldn't do it, they wouldn't pursue it. Um, as far as I know, I, I don't know if we've had offers or been approached, but um, <laughs> uh, I... Quite reassuringly for me, when I was at the Hotel Christina, because that was in the back of my mind, especially after hearing that, you think, oh, maybe they are going to close it. If they are going to close any of the three, it'll probably be that one first. (laughs) But the level of reinvestment is there. And that... It would make no sense to... You wouldn't do it. You wouldn't go and plough a million pound into a business, redecorate every one of the bedrooms, if even in the next five years you were planning on shutting it down. You know, you just wouldn't do it. You'd limp through, you would not run it into the ground, but you, you'd you let things go. You'd reinvest yeah. a minimal amount just to keep it going. You'd try and take out as much money as you could, then you'd sell it. In terms of a passion as well, I can see, you know, the new generation, Alex, being quite passionate about this industry. So I <clears throat> doubt that he'll have this in mind, you know, as soon as you know, you get on the business, be like, flat, I don't care. No. It doesn't look that way. I mean, no, from it doesn't. what I know. It, it doesn't. Yeah. And we're reinvesting the sands yeah. as well. So we're going to be keeping that one for a while. <laughs> We've got new blood coming into the business. Yeah, you know, that's so great. we do have Alex coming in, who's who's really enthusiastic, loves the business. And that'll, that'll be him for the next 30, 40 years. He's, you know, he's, he's he can't wait to, well, he's very much involved now and will only become even more involved. So it's, uh, no, I, I, I think we're pretty secure. Tell me a bit about sport. How this influence your life? Because you're doing some crazy stuff. I mean, I'm talking, you can be today at the Somerville, you know, maybe talking with a guest and the following day, you'll be probably in minus 40 degrees trying to finish whatever you do. You know, it's just yeah. insane. No, I do like the challenges, and uh, but it wasn't always that way. So I suppose between the ages of 16 and 29, I didn't do any exercise. I didn't do anything. I, I worked hard. 
I traveled a bit and I probably drank way too much, partied way too much and just had, uh, yeah, it's probably just not very healthy in general. And then when I was about 29 years of age, I was living in Guernsey. I registered with a GP. They asked me the normal questions a GP would ask. How much do you smoke? How much do you drink? I told them the honest answers. The GP nearly fell off his chair, said that's a ridiculous amount to be drinking. You're not very healthy. Let's get your liver checked. Let's see how you are. Did a load of blood tests and I had a phone call uh, about five days later from the secretary at the at the doctors and said, Mr. Hayes, um, you need to stop drinking. We've had the results back from your liver. It's not very good. You need to stop drinking. I said, yeah, yeah, no problem. When? When? He said, now. Like, you can't drink again. Um, and we'll see if your liver recovers and if, if you know, you're okay. We'll revisit it in a month. And that was a bit of a wake up call for me. So that day I stopped drinking and I decided to give up smoking as well at the same time. Wow. The next morning I went into work and I sort of said to my colleague, oh, I, I need something else to kind of keep me busy. I can't drink. I can't go to the pub. I've, I've got to get healthy, I suppose. And on that day on the front page of the Guernsey press, so the local paper there, it said Guernsey to launch Island Marathon first one in sort of 20 years or 30 years or whatever it was. I was oh great, brilliant. I'll enter that. I'll enter a marathon. So this was kind of March time. The marathon was in August. So I signed up for a marathon and started training for that. Stopped the drinking, stopped the smoking, started running, did a half marathon a couple of months later, did a marathon then. I think before I'd done a marathon, I'd signed up for an Ironman triathlon the next year. And by the time I had done that, I'd signed up to swim the English Channel. So things progressed pretty quick on that side of things. I really took myself away from the pub and threw myself straight into 100% into endurance sports and, and loved it. Since then, I've managed to find a bit more of a balance. So I, I'm allowed to drink and, you know, can, yeah. can do that and, and balance it between pushing myself hard physically uh, and, and, and being able to enjoy life as well. So... Yeah, I started doing endurance sporting events and that was that was 14 years ago. So yeah, I suppose over 14 years I've been doing probably three or four or five ultra marathons every year all over the world. Um, rowing, took up rowing for a year and, and now sort of doing some other bits. So it's really impacted me. It's made me a better person. It's got me out of the pub, which is which is great. It's given me a hobby, something to focus on. Outside of work, I, I'm a firm believer in balance. I think people need to have more than just work and home. I, I think you need a third thing. It doesn't have to be sport. It could be knitting, could be Sudoku, could be anything you want. But I do think people need to have a, a healthy interest outside of work and home. So, you know, you almost need that third thing. It's a hobby. It's something that fascinates me. It's something that I can always dive into uh, and and sort of get excited about so for me it's more now about the adventure I suppose going to places that you haven't been so there's a bit of travel thrown in there it's something I try and only do races now that that scare me either because of the location or the magnitude of it or so you know I, I don't really cycle but I've just signed up for a mountain bike race because the whole race just scares me I, I shouldn't be able to do a 1300 kilometer mountain bike race over the Atlas mountains, but I'll give it a go. So I suppose that, that, that magnitude of the challenge and the fear of failure is what sort of drives me and keeps, keeps me going. Um, and then that transfers into, into life. Like I say, it's, it's probably made me a better person. It's given me another interest, a healthy interest. Hopefully that inspires my kids. Hopefully it inspires my team at work to mm. perhaps push themselves a little bit more, to have a hobby, to 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 do something. So I think it's only positive. Mm. You know, it's only had a positive impact. Um, but it's it's always all about balance. And but that's amazing what you do. I mean, father or three, you know, you could be like, I, as you said, you know, probably after work, let's have a beer, you know, not, not doing anything, not thinking about anything, you know, finding a totally different way of like spending your time off. Yeah. Yeah. But how, how is your, like, how is the family? Is, is the family on board with what you do? Because obviously these are dangerous things you do. It's not like, it's not like you're running around the island and you know, yeah. yeah. Well, I think the wife encourages it. So I'm not sure if she's after life insurance payouts <laughs> or, or what, but she, she's very supportive. I think she, she knows what makes me tick. Yeah. 
I'm a, I suppose a lot of us are, I suppose we're, we're all or nothing type people. If I don't have a race three months away, then I'm not very motivated. You know, nothing I'll, to look for. Yeah, I'll stop going to the gym. It's, it's too far away. Like for, for me, I try and make sure I've got something every three months because every six months, that's not enough. Like I kind of get motivated by, oh my God, I've got a race in a month. I really need to start cramming. It's like when studying for exams in school. You know, you've got six months to study. Well, I wouldn't do that. I'd wait until three days before and then start panicking and that would motivate me then to, to do more. I'm the same with races. If I've got a race six months away, I probably won't do anything for five months. I'll probably be in the pub and be naughty. Yeah. And then I'll have a massive job to do for a month to try and get fit again, ready for this race. So for me, I try and have something yeah. every few months to look forward to. Yeah. And sometimes I'll have a race. I'll be looking forward to a race after the one before it, do you know what I mean? I'll so I'll, I'll have a race in February, but I've also got a race in July. So as soon as I finish, because what you tend to get with these races is you almost get um sort of post race blues. You almost get a bit of a little bit of depression, I suppose. You you spend all your time focusing on something, building up to it, building up to it, getting excited, and then it's gone. It's in the past, and you're sitting there, oh. What do I do now? So I always try and, and I've had that many times. So I always make sure now that I've got something, right, that race is done. I'll have a month recovery where, you know, I'll, I'll go to the pub, I'll socialize and and then I'll start training again for the next one. Yeah, probably for what some people think, you know, that gonna kill them for you kind of keeps you alive, right? Because yeah. if you have it like constantly, it, ca- it keeps you out of trouble. It keeps you, you know, constantly motivated. Absolutely. And I feel like this is how it works for you, right? Yeah, it does. It does. And, you know, it's it's, it's fun as well. And it, it is a social aspect to to the races that I do. And, and you know, you meet some mate. You go down this rabbit hole of, of these endurance races and, and people say, where do you find out about these races? Well, the, the deeper you go down that rabbit hole, the more you see, and the more amazing people you see doing amazing things. You know, I was rowing across the Atlantic in December and yeah. January, pretty much on the start line in December, I was chatting to a bloke and he was rowing as well. And I, I you know, biggest thing that we've ever done. And he said, well, when he gets to Antigua, he's going to go straight down to Peru and spend three weeks climbing mountains as a guide. And I was like, that's really cool. I wish I was doing that. You know, I'm going to go back to work in Jersey and it's going to be <laughs> middle of February and winter and grotty. And he was going down, you know, so really, really cool. And you meet these, uh, you meet people doing some incredible things. You then get a bit of FOMO and you get a bit of jealousy and you think, oh my God, you know, these, these guys. But then, you know, I was, I was thinking about a mate yesterday and I thought he, he's doing some amazing races and, and challenges and things like that. But he isn't married and he doesn't have three kids and he's got different a very priorities. different job. You know, the guy goes and... But that's why it's really impressive, why, impressive mm. what you do because you do it with three children, with a wife, with the, with the job that's demanding. So yeah. that makes it even more impressive. And, as, well, the way I see it, you know, you represented Jersey with what you were doing with, the, with, yeah. the, with, 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 with just fairly recently, you mm-hmm. know, going all the way from here to, what was the place again where you, when you, when you stopped, Antigua? Was oh, when well, we were rowing, yeah, yes. from uh, La Gomera in the Canary Islands to Antigua. Antigua, yeah, so yeah, that 3, was, yeah, so I've seen the video, it was so emotional, like, I've seen, oh yeah. my God, it was, it was really, really good, and I tried following as mm. well, and people would, it was like, yeah, yeah, he's one of ours, well, you quite know, go. big here, we were really grateful, yeah, it, it got was. picked up, I, I think on the back of several bad news stories in November, December, yeah, there was with the-, the gas explosion and things like that. I think Jersey needed, <coughs> excuse me, Jersey needed a good news story. And and that was picked up well by Bailiwick and then, and then JP. Yes. Um. So you know, whilst I wasn't here, my wife would I'd be on the phone to yeah. her from my little rowing boat, and she'd say, "Oh, you're on the your ass is on the front page of the JP <laughs> again. Can you stop sending photos?" I I didn't even know there were photos being taken by Pete, the guy I was rowing with, uh, yeah. of my backside out. Yeah, social media went on fire, and the people yeah. were so proud. I mean, do you need something like that for an island like this mm. to kind of like key people you know you know it almost like motivated although you know probably didn't really i was like man i really hope that they they get there you know yeah. safe and you know i know it's, it's it's challenging and seeing all all this journey i think it was amazing but do you feel like do you see actually that your your children get get a bit of this adventure that you've got do you or do you want them to to do i want them to i want them to find anything that they, they enjoy doing. You know, it doesn't have to, they don't have to follow in my footsteps because crikey, I didn't do any of this till I was 29, you know? Yeah. So, um, I'm, they, they, I don't know if they're inspired by it now. They, they are at times, you know, like they, they loved it while we were doing the row. 
teachers were showing an interest, school kids were showing an interest. It hasn't, I don't think inspired them to do anything sporty yet, but I think it's something that they will reflect on. I think it's something that might have an impact at some point. They might be in their thirties or forties, but at some point I might be long gone and they might be telling their kids. So look, look at, you know, granddad's yeah. certificate of when he did this. It's a talking point. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's something fun. It's something cool. It's something interesting. So hopefully it'll have a positive impact on my kids and their kids, fingers crossed, but it's, it's certainly having a positive impact on me. And that's the main thing. How do you balance all these? Because, you know, for someone hearing that, you know, they've got f- f- most people and you know, I'm not in the situation and I, I don't have children yet. And I feel like sometimes, my God, I don't have time for this, for that, you know, cause I'm doing, I need to do other things. You know, how do you find time for this? How do you balance them all? Well, I suppose from a work point of view, I've got work settled. I, I don't, you know, I, I said, I'm a big advocate for a work-life balance. So I have worked 80, 90 hours a week in the past. I've got no issues with that short term. You get you know, otherwise you get sick. If you try and do that over a long period, it's not healthy. I'm on a 50 hour a week contract and I try and make sure that I'm working as close to that or less than that if possible when I can. And there's, there's always more in the tank if I need to go and pull a 70 hour week because we're short staffed. So, and that's, that's the same with the management team that I've got at the hotel. You know, if we can get away with working less, work less, work smarter, not harder. Um, and, and then if we need to, to, you know, get on the tools and, and pull in some long shifts, um, then we will quite happily. So work isn't the 70, 80 hours that it used to be. It's a lot more controllable. Family life is is fine. So of my three kids, two of my kids don't live with me most of the time, but they're very close. They're teenagers. They don't really need much parenting. And probably they don't want they you don't in their lives now. They don't need it. They don't want it. They're going off and working themselves now. And um, so, and I've got a three-year-old daughter as well that that, that is quite demanding. And, you know, I, I miss out on a lot of time. If I'm on a late shift, she'll be in bed by the time I get home. And then from the race point of view, I think I've got to a stage now where I've done so many races that they actually become more of a mental challenge than a physical challenge. So your mind's capable of a lot more. I suppose it's the mind that gives up before the body. Usually if, if, if you want to achieve something, you will providing you don't get injured, your body will keep going and keep going and keep going as long as you don't get injured if you've got the mental strength. So I see people drop out of races most of the times through choice. And most of the time it's a mental thing. That's something that I'm, I'm really, really stubborn, obviously. So it's people say determined. No, I'm just stubborn. I, <laughs> I sign up to a race. I, I'm going to be I'm, done. I'm gonna finish it. You know, I'm not going home without a t-shirt or a medal or, or the, you know, people say pain is, um, you know, temporary. pain is temporary glory lasts forever. And there's all of those cliches, you know, for me, I love the adventure. I love achieving stuff. You know, I'd hate to sort of not finish an event, but it becomes very much more mental. The, the longer you go, the more mental it becomes. So, uh, you know, and I like the adventure. So I don't need to train. I probably... I probably because you know he's all in here, right? Yeah, which has made me a bit lazy. So I, I train less. <laughs> he's dangerous in a way. <laughs> yeah, well, you train less which makes it even more of them. So I do the events because I like the mental battle. I like yeah. the mental challenge of getting really deep in a dark, dark place and, and getting through it. So I love that mental battle. So actually the less trained I am physically, the more mental battle there is. So what's the incentive to train? Why, why train? Like tick along and I do tick along and I'll train specific. So sort of I'll tick over. I'll always tick over. I'm always doing something, but I probably only train between five and 10 hours a week tops maybe if and then when I get close to an event I'll train specific so if I'm doing an ultra marathon over rocky technical terrain then I'll 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 make sure I find rocky technical terrain here and I'll do hill reps up and down to Sorrel Point or something Mm -hmm. like that so I will train close to an event and specifically for that event but I don't tend to do huge amounts you know I don't think five to ten hours is is a massive amount really but maybe it is (laughs) <laughs> for people that want to find more about you whether you know where you where you're traveling mm-hmm. what crazy things you do around where do they find you on social 
so I've got social accounts on everything. I'm not that active, especially this year. So I'm having a bit of a break from it, although I'm still on there. So Facebook, I'm on there, Steve Hayes. Instagram, Steve Hayes Endurance, Dragonfish Row, if you want to look at what we did with the Atlantic Row earlier on in the year. So that's a, a good fun page. LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn. So if, if you search for Steve Hayes, um, he's the one and only Facebook, Instagram. <laughs> there, there's a few, there's a few of us. If you put on Steve Hayes jersey on Google, you'll get a couple of dodgy fellas, but there'll be a, a fair few photos of me in my rowing gear or my swimming gear. And uh, yeah, my, my son's always sort of doing that. He says, oh, I Googled you in school today and all these pictures came out. I was like, oh, don't do that. There's some shockers on there. <laughs> but yeah, no, reach out to me. And, you know, back to a sort of work point of view, I've always you know we we spoke a little bit earlier mm. about the perception of the industry and um you know that that it's perceived to be a bit of a crappy industry you go into hospitality because you can't do anything else it's not the case it's a really fun industry i'm really passionate about it i love it and i want as many people to come in as they can and you know if anybody wants to reach out if ever, we work with obviously trident students um but if anybody's thinking about going into the industry i'm really happy to chat about it i'm happy for people to come along and shadow me or shadow any other team members at the hotel and just get to know it and i'm really happy mm. I, i'm fortunate that i've worked in everywhere from an 18 bedroom hotel to a 500 bedroom hotel and everything in between I'm more than happy to sit down with anybody, give some advice and perhaps, you know, plan a career or so. Yeah, I'm I'm really keen that more people see it as a fun, exciting, challenging and rewarding industry to work in. Yeah. Simon Sol was saying that uh, hospitality, working in hospitality, even for a short period of time, it should be like almost like national service. And he's absolutely right. And because and it gives you so many life skills, right? Yeah. You, you want to travel? You want to go to Australia and do a, an overseas experience? Great. What's going to fund you through that? What 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 job can you do? You know, if you can, if you're a trained waiter, you can do that anywhere in the world. If you speak the language, and the same with what I do, and and across the industry, if if you can speak the language, there's no country in the world where where you won't find a job. You know, and the amount of people I've spoken to that have worked their way through university or, you know, medical school or or whatever else, it's 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 great to have that little skill set. But it's such an exciting industry to be in, and we didn't really touch on it much, but you become a passionate foodie. You become a wine expert. Yeah. You become a drink Options expert. Options are endless. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so I, I spend my time watching interior design programs because I'm always looking at designs for hotels and, and property management becomes a big part of my job, looking after the maintenance and the fabric of the building that I've been gifted to, to look after. And then, yeah, when I'm not in work and I'm at home watching telly, I'll be watching MasterChef and Great British Menu and learning about new things that perhaps we could implement into our menu and learning about wine. And these things, I was talking to my son about it the other day, it's never ending. You know, knowledge about wine is never ending because there are constantly It's so new, complex. It's so complex. It's so much Food to Food again is complex. Of course. Everything. And trends are changing all the time and new things are happening. It's so dynamic and there's just so much to 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 learn and to enjoy you know who doesn't love great food who doesn't love a nice bottle of wine some people but <laughs> but most like but <laughs> most people like wine as they grow older and you know to to be involved in that is 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 great fun you know so you've got that challenge that flexibility plus you can dip in and out and you know learn a bit more about food learn a bit more about drink you you've got busy rush periods you've got adrenaline rushes it's it's yeah. just fabulous you don't have that in a nine to five office job. You you know, very rarely do you get that adrenaline rush that, that you would have had as a chef when you're getting absolutely humped all night. You got 60, 80, yeah. 100 covers. It's flat out. You, you know, things yeah. are about to go wrong, big time wrong. You're hanging by a thread. And then when you get that service done and you have a beer and you got that camaraderie and you, you know, you, yeah. you, you, the reach. relationships you form because you spend most of your Time yeah, with these people, absolutely. right? Absolutely. You're going to go and spend a third or a half of your life with these people. You get to know them better than your family. You spend more time with them, than, you know, than you might with your family. And then you've got that that adrenaline rush and then that release afterwards. We've just had an absolutely horrendous service or a great service. And, and you've got that that energy going through you. So you, you don't have that in every job. You, yeah. you, you just don't. And that's that's something that... 
people don't appreciate. And I think, you know, once they're bitten by it, once they've experienced it, then it, then it's great. But I was going to ask, you know, what are your, your future uh, plans, you know, career wise, but you kind of like nailed it with what you, you, yeah, you talk along the way. We're kind of there. Like I say, you know, I'm happy with my employer. I, I think they're happy with me. It's more about making sure that, you know, priorities change. It's more about the kids and making sure they're happy and, and making sure the wife's happy, happy wife, happy life and all that lot. Making sure the bills are paid and, and having a, um, you know, a, a reliable employer, having that job security, knowing that you're safe. And, and there's a lot to be said for that when you do have kids and bills is is knowing that you're with a, a stable employer that's, that's yeah, that, that's yeah. going to keep you. There's no surprises there. Yeah, I could take a risk and I could say, look, guys, we're all going to up sticks. I found us a job in Canada. We're all going to give that a shot. It's a hell of a risk. I'm not that much of a risk taker. I'm pretty stable. I'm pretty, I'm a safety guy. So yeah. uh, I'm a safety guy, but in a way, you kind of, it's kind of a weird twist you've got in your life because you are a safety guy from the job perspective, but you would go and cycle, you know, in Atlas Ooh. Mountains, you know, where probably you're going to put your life in danger. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Gemini. There's two sides to me, at least two, at least two. So there's, there's the safe and reliable and then there's going, yeah, put your life on, on the line and, and do something a bit crazy. But yeah, it is, it's, uh, no, I'm, I'm happy with the way I've chosen it and I've, yeah. I've picked a good employer that I'm very happy with. Yeah. I mean, my experience, as I said at the beginning, and I'm not, I'm not getting paid by anybody. I shouldn't probably even say it, you know, if I, if I, if I don't, if I don't feel it, I, I believe that you know my time with my my time with Dolans was one of the best times, if not the best, in terms of like relationship between employee and employer. Genuinely, I mean, with people working, that's a different story. You can get good and bad in terms of colleagues, but in terms of in terms of like level of care, the way they care about their staff and everything else, and I'm sure you know this stay pretty much the same because mm. it's the same people that own it, it's the same people that are there. So. I I have nothing bad to say, to be honest yeah. with you. We've only got better. And, oh, and, you got you better. Know, okay, yeah, perfect. We've, so we've got better and, and you know, we, yeah. we've learned, we're learning, we're evolving and, yeah, we're getting better all the time. So people, people they want to find you, want a job, Steve Hayes on LinkedIn, on whatever else, you yeah. know, get in touch. And pop up to the hotel. I, I love visitors. Come and see us. I'll this bore you to tears <laughs> with eight hours of rowing talk and then we'll we'll chuck in a bit about the industry. But yeah, come and see me. Come up to the Somerville. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Steve, was an absolute pleasure. Amazing pleasure. talk. Yeah, genuinely amazing. <laughs> and I'm glad that you made it here. So yeah, yeah thank you so thanks much. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Cheers, buddy.